This program is made possible by the support of Delta Dental, Quick Trip, Marshfield Clinic Health System, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Hospital Association. Watch Wisconsin Eye on Spectrum Channels 995 and 363 and at wisi.org. One more minute. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the DNR's 2021 February Wolf Hunt Media Briefing. My name is Sarah Hoy, and I'm the Communications Director for the DNR. Joining us today from the DNR are Keith Warnke, Division Administrator for the DNR's Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Division. Eric Loebner, Wildlife Management Director, also with the Fish and Wildlife and Parks Division. Randy Johnson, DNR's Large Cornivore Specialist. Kimberly Curry, DNR Customer Service Director, and Matt O'Brien, DNR Deputy Chief Warden. Following brief remarks from Keith Warnke, we will take questions. With that, I will turn it over to Keith. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Keith Warnke. I am the DNR's Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Division Administrator. The department complied with a circuit court order to immediately implement a wolf harvest season in excuse me, in February. Following an application period and drawing, the February wolf hunt got started on Monday. On Tuesday, we announced the closing of the first three zones at 10 a.m., followed by announcing the closure of the remaining three zones at 3 p.m. that afternoon. Those zones then closed 24 hours after the announcement. Hunters have 24 hours to report their wolf harvest to our game reg system. All wolf hunting was closed by 3 p.m. yesterday when the final three zones closed. We continue to believe, as we stated in December and several times earlier this year, that a transparent and inclusive process implemented over several months instead of a few days produces the best season results for all interested parties. Although the time frame for doing so was short, we used the best available science while following existing laws to implement the season. As of 3 p.m. today, 216 wolves have been reported in game reg. The harvest breakdown was 86% taken by use of dogs, 5% taken by trappers, and 9% by other hunting methods. 54% of the harvested wolves were reported as male and 46 as female. We monitored reported harvest constantly. The decision to close zones was made using the best available harvest data and following the law, we issued a 24 hour notice of closure. I want to profoundly thank all of the DNR staff who worked tirelessly to make this hunt happen. Their dedication and skill cannot be overstated. With that, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll begin alphabetically. Todd Richmond, Associated Press. Hi, Keith. Um, can we get those stats again on your 216 and how many are taken by dogs, et cetera? Yeah, sure thing. 216, as of 3 p.m. today, 216 were reported in our game reg system. Um, the breakdown was 86% taken by the use of dogs. 5% taken by trappers, and 9% taken by other hunting methods. Did you want the, the breakdown between males and females? 
Yes, please. Uh, 54 percent male and 46 percent female. Thank you, Todd. Larry Lee, Brownfield. Larry, are you with us today? All right, moving on. John Myers, Duluth News, Tribune. I don't see John, but Larry, it looked like you joined us. Larry, did you have a question? I do have a question. Thank you. Uh, do you believe the statistics from this short but apparently effective hunt will help you really zone in on what the real wolf population is, especially where the one that surprised me, Zone 6, which uh, filled up really fast in the southern part of the state? I'll uh, add that one to Randy, I think. Sure. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll we'll evaluate all the data that's been collected. Um, one of the certainly important pieces of information is where the harvest is taking place. Um, and and uh, we have a new occupancy model uh, that we'll be able to to evaluate this data with as well. And, and that'll certainly help improve our understanding of the population. Do we have a breakdown of what zones had the most hunters? The permits were... Uh, you can take them in any open zone. So um, I don't know that we have good data on which. Okay. We'll have to uh, size me up for the shot real quick. There we go. I don't know if you got that, Larry, but uh, the, the permits are, are open in any uh, open zone. So folks can bounce around as they need to in any zone that's not been closed. Thank you. Thank you. John, I believe I saw you on, John Myers. Yeah, can you hear me? We can. All right, thanks. <laughs> um, just check it, you guys uh, playing Monday morning quarterback here, could you have closed the season a little earlier to keep that total harvest closer to um, the 119 uh, quota goal? Um, I realize you need the 24 hour you know, notice, but uh, it seems like it just went too far, it went too long if, if you were trying to shoot 119 wolves. Hey, John, this is uh, Eric Lobner, the director for the Wildlife Management Program. I'll take this one quick. Yeah, you know, like just like you said, um, it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback as you look back at it. But I will say, you know, um, when we started monitoring the season, which was right away on, on Monday, um, at the end of the day, we were at nine animals harvested. Um, when we came in to work the next day, looking at the numbers, we were up to 48. And we immediately, we started monitoring the population constantly, or the harvest, I should say, constantly. And immediately we took that initiative to close the first three zones. And, you know, certainly it didn't take us long by the time we looked at that and worked through that closure that by the time it got around to noon, we were already talking about and implementing processes necessary to uh, close the remaining three zones. So, yeah, it's easy to, at this point, stage of the game to say, yeah, we maybe should have closed it a little bit sooner. But um, certainly we were monitoring that population or monitoring that harvest constant. And we had everybody working hard to just stay on top of what's going on. And again, it was based on harvest rates as they were coming in and what people were reporting. And ultimately, you know, we ended up going going a hair over. Did a quick follow, did the speed of the of the hunter success surprise you folks? I mean, it, it just seemed a, a pretty high success rate pretty quick. Yeah, I'll uh, hand that one off to Randy um, here. But, you know, certainly we talked about that earlier today as well. Just, uh, you know, there were so many unknowns about how, how the season was going to play out. It started on a on a Tuesday or I'm sorry, on a Monday, uh, a weekday um, it was a short period for uh, people to prepare, but um, I'll hand it off to Randy to fill you in. Sure. And uh, I can mention to large carnivore specialist, uh, my title. Um, yeah. As, as Eric mentioned, you know, we going into the season um, this late in, the, in February was fairly unprecedented and, and we played out a lot of different scenarios um, and ways it could have gone. And uh, certainly this was one we considered, um, you know, we, the use of dogs is a, is a very efficient method of harvest um, and it was allowed this full season and uh, certainly in my neck of the woods in northern Wisconsin we had fresh snow both Monday morning and Tuesday morning um, which is ideal condition for for tracking wolves both with the use of dogs or really any method 
Um, so a lot of factors came into play here, and uh, I think that's definitely what we saw. Yeah, I'll just add to that too. Um, you know, we the other thing that we had playing out here is that the, the we ultimately we issued um, at the direction of the board we issued 20 times the quota number, which we typically for our previous seasons, and they were a while ago, so it's it's hard to necessarily compare apples to apples, but we, we issued 10 times the quota in those previous situations. And I know in a number of our other species, we generally have um, permit issuance rates uh, much closer to what we currently have or than what we issued here, for sure. Thank you. Fox 6 News. Fox 6? Moving on. Kevin Nays. Kevin. Moving on, Brandon Gordon, K-Bay JR. KSTP, KSTP. Joshua Scramlin, Midwest Farm Report. Joshua? Pam Janke. Midwest Farm Report. Paul Smith, Milwaukee Journal. Uh, yes, uh, please address what your primary concerns are for going this far over the uh, established quota. Thank you. Would you yeah, like that so one, Eric? Yeah, yeah, I'll start it out and then Randy, I'll hand it back to you. But okay. hey, Paul, um, it's Eric Lobner from uh, Wildlife Management Program. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so certainly one thing that we're watching now is, you know, when we set our population or our quota, we looked at trying to make sure that we were um, conservative in our approach so that we weren't going to have a negative impact on the population and basically just keep it at a sustainable level. So essentially that allowed us some, some opportunities there, but certainly looking at where we went over, um, how far we went over goal was not necessarily our objective here for sure. And so we're gonna be monitoring that very closely. Um, you know, we've got a tracking process that we're working through right now to get more data for looking at our fall harvest opportunities. But um, I'll kind of hand it off to Randy too to talk more of the details specific to um, how we're looking at the season and the steps that we'll be taking to basically take this information into consideration as we evaluate. Yep, absolutely. So um, as, as Eric said, when we, we're putting the season together. The objective here was to uh, put out a quota that <clears throat> would not result in significant population change. Um, you know, the population model projections are a big part of that. Um, and yet there's also always uncertainty. Um, the quota, you know, there's still a percentage or a, a, a probability that a quota of 200 may reduce the population or it may allow the population to expand. And so going over, uh, what are we at, 216, I think, um, you know, relatively small uh, percentage over the total quota. And so I would say there's low concern, you know, at the population level um, of any significant effects there. Um, and, and as Eric said, we'll, you know, we're collecting data on, on the sex of the individuals, the, the, the age, um, all those different types of things. And we'll evaluate all of that as it relates to uh, the different impacts um, and, and, you know, use that information as we, as we look towards next fall. Just throw in there quick too, Paul, this is Keith. Um, we have a robust resilient wolf population. So the ability to manage them, um, I think we, we are very, very confident that we'll be able to manage properly going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Susan Bentz, Milwaukee Public Radio. Hi there, could you explain what other hunting methods means? And um, I'm wondering when you will start to form the advisory committee that will be part of the next process. Sure, I can take that one. <clears throat> so folks have a, a few different options of, uh, you know, the, the different methods that are allowed. Other is just kind of a, a catch-all category. Um, you know, primarily we consider that uh, incidental take or, um, you know, uh, having a permit and 
and uh, encountering a wolf while you're doing something else, those types of things. It generally makes up a very small percentage of harvest, and that's again what we saw here. Um, to your second part, um, we're, you know, we'll be looking to bring that committee together here sometime this spring. Um, you know, we'll we'll certainly uh, want to have some updated population information, um, both from from this season as well as uh, our tracking efforts uh, from this winter and. Those don't wrap up here for a little bit yet, so um, sometime this spring. All right, thank you. Jason Rice, NBC 15, Jason Rice. Were there any uh, violations or citations issued or any poaching concerns for this hunt? Thanks for the question, Matt O'Brien, Deputy Chief Warden, um, Division of Public Safety Resource Protection here at DNR. I would say that this year's uh, season has been standard by all accounts from an enforcement perspective. And I use that um, the lens of both 2014 and our prior seasons, as well as our normal hunting seasons that we have, you know, you know, whether that be deer hunting or whatever, insofar as that uh, you know, we had staff out in full force uh, doing proactive compliance checks, um, we have confidential violation tip line that uh, folks that have concerns can submit tips to, and, and we have our staff uh, run out, investigate those, and uh, determine credibility and and find out uh, what's going on, on out in the landscape. And I think the general summary is, uh, by and large, voluntary compliance. Uh, obviously, the short season, a lot of folks were just trying to get out there and and uh, and have an opportunity to harvest. But like with every season, we've had uh, a handful of events that uh, you know result in varying levels of enforcement action, uh, which is pretty standard. So I think by and large, uh, really impressed with um, the landscape that was out there and uh, no significant user conflicts that bubbled up or anything like that. Thank you. Jonathan Neiser, NBC 26. Jonathan? My question's been answered, thank you. Thank you. Eileen, Northwood Star Journal. Eileen. Oh, thank you. My question was answered as well. Thank you. Dick Ellis, out on Wisconsin Outdoors. Dick Ellis. Okay, next up. Frank Zufall, Sawyer County Record. Frank? Uh, yes. Um Exactly how many permits were issued? I, I, I heard at one time there was 4,000 available, but how many were actually issued? I can sure take that one. Um, yeah, so the, the 4,000 number is, is a result of uh, the original 200 quota, uh, which was approved, um, as mentioned earlier, uh, distributing 20 permits per quota you know, uh, 4,000. Um, following the tribal declaration, that state quota was re reduced to 119. Um, 119 times 20 is 2,380 permits available to state hunters. Um, that's what was awarded in the drawing. And then of those, I believe we sold approximately 65%. So whatever that number is, 4 1,400 and some change. Okay, so n not all the available permits were used then? Correct, which is fairly standard to other seasons uh, in that situation. Hey, I've got to come. I've uh, interviewed uh, Adrian Weider, the former DNR wolf expert, several times, and and he has said that in past wolf hunts, that the majority of the wolves killed or taken were adult. I mean, were adolescent wolves, and he has uh, his uh, premises that. Uh, because they take a majority of adolescent wolves that really doesn't have an impact on the population because the, the adult breeding uh, wolves are still alive. And um, or do you take that into consideration when you look at uh, uh, the call call numbers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that was, you're spot on. That's what we saw in, in the previous seasons here. Um, you know, part of that is also that's, you know, looking at the population as a whole, your juveniles, your younger ages are the larger age classes. There's more of them on the landscape. Um, and so, yes, that's all consistent. Um, in, in this season, again, we're collecting data from each individual wolf that's been harvested, uh, looking at the sex and the age structure um, and all that plays in as well. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Helena Wares, Daily Cardinal. Helena. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, so during the meeting in January with the Wisconsin Natural Resources Board, there was concern regarding the accuracy of the population count and how a hunt close to the breeding season can affect population dynamics. How confident are you that you have had ample time to gather scientific data to ensure that the wolf population is stable into the future? I think I think we're confident on that. You know, um, a lot of the uh, the science and the data that we looked at in formulating this quota um, was was similar to what was used in previous seasons as far as the response to harvest, those types of things. You know, we were able to look back at those previous seasons and, and look how the populations responded. Um, you know, information like what was in the last question there, uh, things that indicate that most of the harvest is the juvenile individuals, those types of things, you know, where you're not uh, impacting the breeding population as much. Um, you know, we've got a lot of good data there to lean on and, and certainly considered all of it uh, with this season. Thank you. Tony Aria, TMJ4, Tony Aria. Moving on, Tom Lally, WAOW. Tom? Yes, when you guys are setting the quota, do you go with a lower number anticipating that the end number will be higher? We, go ahead, Randy. Yep. Oh, okay, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, in quota discussions with wolves or really any species, there's a lot of considerations. Um, you know, we have to always keep in mind, you know, some years in some quotas, we, we are short, some years we go over. Um, that all that all plays in. Um, however, once we decide a quota, in this case 200, um, you know, we, we certainly do our best to try to reach that quota. Um, however, you know, especially with this season framework, uh, it can be difficult, um, you know, as what we saw. <clears throat> I'll just add to what Randy had to say, you know, when we were working on the population models on this particular situation, we had um, numbers ranging from 200 to 220 as a general quota that would basically keep the population stable. So just as Randy mentioned, we work to generally and very seldom do you ever just pick a number and say that's what it's going to be. So we ended up picking on the conservative end of that range. We said 200, um, recognizing you're never going to hit that number exactly. And so with all populations, when you manage it as a general rule of thumb for wildlife management practices, you've got a range of what you look at and what those impacts will be. Thank you. Nate Vandergrift, WBAY. Nate? Hi, this is Katie Anderson um, with WBAY. And I was curious, um, have all the Native Americans or uh, the Ojibwe tribes also reported and is that included in these numbers? Yeah, so we don't typically, when the, the tribal numbers don't typically come to us until after any sort of season and their seasons recognized are not um, associated with ours at all. They can have completely different season structure and season framework. So these numbers that you see before you or heard for you now are strictly based on uh, non-tribal harvest. Thank you. Nicholas Lentz, WCCO. Nicholas? Chloe Rosen, also WCCO. All right, Greg Grell, WDSE. Greg? Uh, Randy, what was the harvest uh, like in the northern uh, districts, uh, northwestern Wisconsin? Uh, did you see what you expected uh, in that area? Yeah, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, you know, we have six harvest zones and we have a percentage of each quota, you know, uh, dedicated to each one. Um, I think the Northwest was one of our high, higher uh, uh, higher zones as far as the quota goes. Um, but from what my memory is here, just looking at them the last time, I think we saw fairly even distribution of harvest. Um, you know, as I said, we were collecting information on the county of harvest um, as well as the actual uh, you know, very close uh, latitude, longitude of harvest. And we'll we'll take a look at all of those as it relates to, um, you know, all kinds of things, but just haven't had a chance to dive into that yet. Thank you. Dwayne Walter, W-E-A-U. Dwayne?
Jonathan, W-H-B-Y, Jonathan. Dan Hansen, Wisconsin farmer. Dan Hansen. Karen, Wisconsin Farm Bureau. Karen or Tyler. No questions, thank you. Thank you. Dean Bortz, Wisconsin Outdoor News. Dean Bortz. Danielle Kading. Hi, um, how are you going to monitor what impact the hunt has had on the population and how did the wolf population respond after the prior three wolf hunts? Yeah, good questions. Um, you know, certainly part of it is looking at the age structure and the sex makeup of the harvest um, and, and see how that relates to, <clears throat> relates to, you know, potential reproductive impacts there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, our, our, our population monitoring efforts are underway right now. A lot of data has been collected previous to the hunt and we've still got another month or so to go after the hunt. And so we'll be able to kind of take a look at um, any potential impacts there. Um, once we produce the new population estimate for this winter, um, we'll be able to factor in those types of things. And then uh, as we look towards next fall, um, you know, we'll have updated information to use as we look at those quotas uh, down the road uh, for next fall. Uh, as far as the other question, response to harvest in previous seasons, um, you know, each of the seasons had a little bit different response because there was different objectives with each one. Um, but generally speaking, I believe the first season, you know, the population did not decline much at all. Um, in the second season, the quotas were increased uh, to lower the population, and that's what resulted. I think it dropped some 20% uh, off the top of my head. Um, and then that third, third season, uh, quotas were reduced, and the population actually increased despite the harvest. Um, so as, as Keith mentioned earlier, wolf populations are resilient, and, and they can sustain a, a fairly high level of, of uh, mortality or harvest. Um, and, and it's also important to keep in mind, specifically here with Wisconsin, our population is, is neighbored. You know, this is, we've got wolves in, in the UP, we've got wolves in Minnesota, uh, Ontario. There's a lot of movement between all three. So, you know, this is, this is a segment of a much larger and well-connected healthy wolf population. Thank you. Chris Hubbock, Wisconsin State Journal. Yeah, thanks. Um, when you're talking about the the results, are you operating under the assumption that the tribes will not use their 81 allocation? Yes, I'll just kind of add there, um, you know, our population or our quota for non-tribal harvest is 119. And so we didn't go into the season attempting, you know, to consume the entire harvest. We were set out to assuming the tribes are not, we're going to harvest their 81 animals. They were allocated that, that's federal law through stipulations. Um, so our process looks at really, our goal was to stick at 119. Does that help answer your question, Chris, or was there any follow up there? Um, yeah, I guess so then, I mean, if, under that assumption, then you could, you could say that, that, you know, the harvest could be closer to 300, right? I don't want to speculate. You know, our our understanding based on communications we've had with, with tribes, um, you know, I don't know if they'll harvest our, um, or not, but we'll we'll see what ends up coming in in the end. Okay, and if I can follow up, how, how significant are the, the zonal quotas? Um, and, and some of the zones, I know we were, you know, double what the quota was, can that impact local wolf populations or is it much more fluid? Yeah, so I'll just touch on, on the uh, zones and then I'll hand it back to Randy. But so the zone, you know, with this year in our particular situation, when we looked at the model that gave us an estimate of, you know, if we took, if we harvested 200 to 220 and we chose 200, 
um, when we looked at that, we spread that across the landscape based on where known populations of wolves existed based on the packs, and then evenly distributed that harvest into those zones based on that wolf population. So real cursory, I would say, yeah, you know, if all of your harvest in a certain zone occurred within a certain confined area, you could have a localized impact um, on a broad scale, as, as Randy mentioned uh, earlier, and I'll pass it off to him. You know, our populations are very robust. Uh, wolf wolves have a large home range, and certainly, you know, there's a lot of ingress and egress that occurs across the state lines, as well as across these different areas. Um, and so certainly that, that comes into play here as well. Randy, did I miss, on any, miss anything there? No, I think you hit it just right. I was, I was just gonna mention that last part again was, you know, the zones are, the zones are road boundaries, things like that, that, that we follow, but the wolves certainly don't follow it. So home ranges overlap, movement between zones, uh, all kinds of things. You know, it's, it's, it's a way for us to direct harvest pressure as, as Eric mentioned. Um, and yet, you know, the population itself uh, is one population. Thank you. And also, uh, that's a good segue point there. So for any folks who are looking for specifics regarding tribes, you should contact Dylan Jennings, uh, who is the director of their public information office at the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, otherwise known as Glithwick. And for those of you who need that contact information, you can drop it in the chat and we'll be able to share that with you. Moving on, John Schroeder. Royce, WIS Politics. Danny Maxwell, WKOW. Steve Asplund, WLUC. Macy Cosmore, also WLUC. Um, my question was answered already, thank you. Thank you. Brian Caring, WLUK. Brian? Looking at what you've learned in the first blush from this, anything that you know looking forward to the November hunt that you wanna do the same, wanna do differently? And then second part, any thoughts on what the quota might be for the hunt in this fall? I guess uh, all I'd say to that is, is you know, we'll, we'll look at uh, all of the different factors here. You know, I, I think it's very premature to, to talk about quotas for next fall. Um, you know, we, we've got to see what the impact here is. Uh, bring together our advisory committee, consult with the tribes, public input. I mean, all of the processes that we'd like to go through um, and through those processes, you know, we'll determine objectives and quotas. Is there anything that you saw that bothered you how the hunt went that looking forward you're going to recommend let's do something differently i think there's always room for improvement but uh you know those are those are questions that are considered through the committee process um you know and and significant changes to any season like this should go through committee and, and through those public input steps i don't know that we have any specific recommendations at this point yeah, I'll also add to, um, you know, much of the framework and the systems that we use to implement the season are set in state statute. And so those would require legislative uh, involvement to change those. And so we're implementing a season that was laid out in state statute. So some of those things, um, some people have asked about the 24 hour closure. Why didn't you close it sooner? That's that's identified in state statute and it's not um, we're not able to change that on our own. Thank you. Pat Durkin. Pat Durkin. Yeah, Sarah, thanks. I I must have forgotten to check the box about asking a question, but I, I guess my overall thought here was um, you guys really did not want the season. You knew going into it, we'd have pretty much wide open hound hunting. And I'm just wondering if um, in setting this quota the way it was, Looking at now, we're basically a hundred over the quota you guys wanted for um, non-tribal. I gotta believe this is not sitting real, real well with you guys right now. And what's what's your reaction internally to it? So, that, uh, 
Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, I guess Randy can answer, but uh, our reaction internally is, is going to depend on population estimates from this winter and how the population reacts and responds, you know, and, and you know, like we said before, once we received the court order, you know, we acted immediately to comply and um, we, I think, did um, our level best to comply and follow the science, the best existing science and follow existing law uh, to, to put this on in a very short time frame. Does it disappoint you at all though, Keith, that the first three seasons, the DNR nailed this thing down so tightly, barely over the quarter of all three years. This year, the expression you see in every article basically is we blew past that number. And are you, are you hearing anything from the board right now about their involvement in this and basically put you in this spot? No, I haven't heard from the board yet about, about the quota. Um, there were a number of factors, as Randy outlined uh, before, the, the perfect weather conditions, um, the uh, doubling of the ratio of, of permits to quotas from what we have previously had, um, and a lot of other things that went into affecting the harvest. So I think, like I mentioned before, we're going to have to digest this and um, bring in the wolf experts and bring in our partner experts uh, before we have any kind of a reaction one way or another. Also, uh, for Matt, um, did, you, did you actually have a number of different violations, number of citations actually written? Uh, thanks, Pat, Matt O'Brien, Deputy Chief Warden. Uh, we don't have that yet. Um, every year we compile an annual enforcement summary. Uh, and as a part of this season, we will compile all that. So obviously our staff are busy right now um, the past few days ensuring that uh, we've got good voluntary compliance that the public remains safe that they're responding and investigating complaints and then over the next uh, few days we'll continue to go through the rest of the registration steps and uh, our staff will finalize up their reports and uh, enforcement action that we're going to gather a uh, summary data set from that and we'll make it uh, available as part of that uh, standard uh, public posting that we have uh, every year so there'll be a specific totals report very similar to uh, what I know we've provided in years past uh, for this season. Okay. Um, did you deploy extra wardens into the areas where you expected more guys hunting? Uh, we didn't have to move any staff around, uh, especially just for this effort, but uh, obviously the, the distribution of folks that we have, um, we understand the significance of what this event is, the fact that uh, uh, there's so many different aspects of the public that have an interest and uh, making sure that we've got all hands on deck for our staffing uh, to make sure that, that this season has good integrity, uh, right? That's our responsibility in this is to ensure that uh, the public's safe and that the biological uh, management folks can uh, rely on their data sets because we know that there's integrity out there on the ground level. Uh, and really, you know, it, uh, from just a perspective, this type of a season uh, in some respects has a statewide effort, uh, right? Because uh, although folks may have harvest in certain areas of the state, they live in other areas. So where we register for isn't always in the same areas uh, where the harvest occurs and certainly where we get complaints uh, sometimes comes where uh, folks live or through various different uh, you know internet channels as well. So in a lot of respects, it, it's a statewide effort uh, naturally. Thank you. Tony Langfellow, WSAW. Tony. Danny Smith, WXOW. Kate Thornton, WXPR. Hi, thank you for holding the call. Um, this is probably for Matt. Um, we saw on social media that um, some wolf advocate groups and even some tribal communities um, had posted about asking for volunteers to kind of self patrol. And I was just wondering if you saw any conflicts between hunters and these groups. No, we haven't. I appreciate the question. You know, uh, in years past, obviously there's a lot of uh, polarized public viewpoints on wolf management. And I think, uh, you know, by and large, what's impressive is the civil dialogue uh, 
that we've sort of seen out at the field level. I know in the social media world, there's a lot of hyperbole and invective these days, uh, but by and large, um, I know as we briefed our staff going out there to recognize that uh, not only do we have uh, hunters and there's there's uh, you know constitutional hunting rights out there, but there's constitutional First Amendment rights for folks that have other viewpoints. And uh, when I said earlier that this was a standard season, I think that's um, by and large reflective of the, of the fact that uh, all the user groups seem to be very respectful of, of one another, and we certainly appreciate that. Thank you. I also wore a tech issue here. I want to circle back to Todd Richmond. Todd, I believe you had a, a question. We, we, we weren't able to hear you. Yeah, I didn't know that we get a chance to ask multiple questions each round, but uh, I just want to touch, go back to the beginning here when Eric and, and Randy, I heard you, I heard Eric say that we went a hair over the quota. I hear Randy say we went over by a small percentage. Well, actually you didn't. It, it's almost 100% over. You almost doubled, doubled your quota. I, I just don't understand how DNR could not have been monitoring this more closely and seeing projections that you should have closed the season earlier, like by Monday afternoon, why weren't you projecting that you were gonna you were just going to, you know, roll past this quota easily within hours? I don't understand how DNR could not have seen that. Can can you help me ex can you explain why? Sure, Todd, this is Eric Lobner again. Um, I'll just share, you know, we started immediately monitoring the season. Um, Randy pretty much checked that harvest that was reported every hour, if not more often. Um, at the end of the day on Monday, we had nine wolves harvested or at least nine wolves registered. And so that's an important aspect to keep in mind is that the way the system and the season is set up is that hunters have uh, 24 hours or to report their harvest, right? They have, there's a time lag from the time that they harvest the animal to the time that they actually register that animal. So at the end of the day on Monday, and there were various times, I would say even Monday night where I reached out to Randy, Randy would reach out to me, hey, this is where we're at. Um, we started out and we had daily uh, check-ins starting at seven o'clock. And our first one on seven, seven o'clock on Tuesday morning, is where at that point we had 48 animals, if I remember correctly, were uh, registered. And so when you think about a total harvest of 119 or a total quota, I should say of 119, yeah, you know, um, we looked at it, we're like, you know what, we, we've got concern in these zones, but there were a number of zones at that stage of the game that had zero, zero animals reported. So we, but we looked at it on a zone basis and we said, you know what, these three zones we need to take some serious approach here and uh, and close those zones. And so by 10 o'clock, we implement we implemented that closure. We had again there were regular checkups every hour as the season progressed. Um, by the time we got to as I mentioned earlier, by the time we got to noon, um, we were I think if I remember correctly, we had 70 animal or 70 percent of the harvest was in uh, was reported. And so at that point. That's where we made the decision, you know what, we got to close the season and we need to shut it down now uh, as soon as we can. And so we took that action. We got the uh, secretary's order signed and became effective at three o'clock on, on Tuesday. And so, yeah, you know, should we, should we, would we, could we have done it sooner? Um, based on the data that we had before us, we were doing our best to try and hit that 119 number. And did we go over? We did, we did go over. Um, is that something that we wanted to have happen? Absolutely not. I yep. just a quick follow up, Sarah. Um, is the 24 hour lag in registering becoming a problem in getting real time fixes yeah. on where harvests understand in real time? Is that an issue? Is that that 24 hour lag um, set in statute? It is, it is set in statute. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, I think is important to point out that it will be certainly something that we'll look at into the future is this uh, 20 times the quota number. Um, if you just think about that, you had 20 people out there for every one tag that you, one uh, animal that you wanted harvested. That creates in a situation where you're looking at harvesting 119 animals, 
um, that makes it very difficult to manage and hit that number. And so it is important for us as we were moving forward to, to revisit that, certainly um, get that more in line with what we normally would harvest, uh, the no normally issue for the number of permits per quota. Um, and that's, that's kind of where we're at. Yep, I, if I may, I'll, I'll jump on and add two points. One is, as Eric mentioned, I, I watched the, the harvest information actually about every <laughs> 15 minutes. Uh, and it, it, as it picked up, it picked up in a hurry. And, and actually, I, I just before the call threw together some information, we took registrations at all hours of the day and night. Uh, we have registrations at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Very difficult to, to predict exactly what that trajectory was going to be. Um, the second point in reference to the first part of your, your comment there, um, you know, we, we, there's two separate issues with going over the quota. Yes, we exceeded the 119. That's a separate issue uh, as I was speaking about it. And, and I think Eric as well, um, looking at the impacts to the population. Uh, again, that quota was 200 uh, and, and distributed uh, between the state and tribe. But in reference to impacts on the population, um, that is less of an overage. So hopefully that clarifies that part. Okay, thank you everybody. We are a little bit over. Uh, so we will wrap things up. Once again, thank you for joining us today. That does conclude our media briefing. Should you have any follow-up questions, please email us at dnrpress at wisconsin.gov. Again, that is dnrpress at wisconsin.gov. Thanks to everybody for joining us today. Have a wonderful afternoon and enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civics broadcast network, providing gavel-to-gavel -gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol.